welcome to the first episode of Real Sciences podcast in English language. Our first episode is going to be an interview with Dr. Spencer Kelly, professor of psychology and neuroscience in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences in Colgate University. Welcome, Dr. Kelly. We are very pleased to meet you. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. Uh, as I said, uh, Doctor, it is like a dream for me to meet you. I've uh, already cited many of uh, the facts that you mentioned in, in your book, The Language in the Mind, and many of the articles, the studies that you shared, and uh, it's just a good experience to meet you in person, actually virtually, but to have this meeting and to be able to ask you more about uh, about the field and about many of the uh, topics that uh, I related to while listening to your book. I will share the link of the book, which is available in audio version, version that I listened to so that the audience can uh, reach the, the, the book as well. So, uh, Dr. Kelly, my first question will be about language for the children below one year. Many of us think that the children don't have any any knowledge or any kind of processing for the language in the brain in the b below one year. But I, you mentioned that uh, listening to multiple languages could enhance the perspective taking and the categorical perception. So how can a, a mother or a father make benefit of such a fact while dealing with uh, a child who who is still below one year old? Mm. Well, the, the, the first really interesting thing that you, you mentioned there is that uh, babies know a lot more than they let on. Uh, if you just look at a baby, it seems like they're basically sleeping, crying, and eating all the time, but they're, they're already have some impressive skills. And so you mentioned uh, understanding the, the language, for example, in your native language or, or, or understanding two languages in your, your environment. Babies can already differentiate speech sounds at birth, at literally one day of age, they're, they're categorically separating sounds that are not only in their native language, but remarkably in every language that could, could exist. And so regardless of where a baby's born, they have an innate ability to hear the, the speech sounds and distinguish them in their native language. And what happens over the first year of life is if you're exposed to just one language, you narrow your neural capacity just to distinguish those speech sounds in, in your native language, and you lose the ability to, to distinguish all those other sounds. So if I, I'm born into English speaking parents, I start being able to hear all these sounds, but then I specialize in English phonemes and English categories, and then I lose this other ability. The beauty of being exposed to multiple languages uh, early on, what we, what we call crib bilinguals. Uh, a crib bilingual is exposed to, let's say, at least two languages in the crib at birth. They can handle those two languages and they can keep them separate. And I can talk about how they do that, but they can handle those. And so they're not creating anything. They're just not eliminating as much as a monolingual. And so basically a bilingual or trilingual is just keeping the languages abilities that were already there innately open, whereas everyone else shuts them down because they don't hear them. And so what I would recommend to any uh, parent who wants their child to be bilingual is speak multiple languages to, to your child, even if it doesn't look like they're paying attention or listening, they're learning. And here's a tip. Uh, it's best if one parent speaks in one language and another parent speaks in another language and you keep that kind of, not rigid, but you would want to keep it pretty consistent. It's easier to learn language in multiple languages if you can associate one person with like English and another parent with like Arabic, for example. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. I think that would still be a great topic, and uh, we we cannot uh, take all the, in the podcast time in discussing this. Uh, but we can advise the audience to uh, listen to the book or read it. But the other interesting topic, which I related with a story that happened uh, in my area when where I was living in, uh, in Iraq. Uh, there was an uh, interesting story of a guy who had a stuttering. Uh, when he was reading Quran, or actually some kind of singing, he never stuttered. Everybody thought that it's a miracle. 
simply and it is happening because of the Quran and I listened to story of Megan Washington and mm. uh, your explanation about it which I needed to listen to that part I think twice just to get better understanding of the idea but uh, can you explain it to the audience what happens when someone who has uh, stuttering sings simply why there is no stuttering when someone is singing R right and I'll just I'll give your your audience another way to appreciate this the the famous movie The King's Speech I don't know if if you've yes. heard of The King's Speech uh, where uh, the the king had a stuttering problem and he learned to get better by singing instead of speaking and that ultimately gave him the confidence to give his speech and so that's in popular culture you can you can see that the the neuroscience behind it comes down to understanding a basic neuroanatomy about the the fact that our brains are, are separated into two hemispheres and so we have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere and they they look very similar just to the naked eye but if you look at the cellular structure and start to look at how areas are connected and mapped out, they're, they're different in important ways. And they're, they're different in a lot of ways, but I'll just focus on the stuttering example. The left hemisphere has a region called Broca's area. And I know that uh, you know, your audience might be familiar with this region that's normally associated with language production. So as I'm speaking right now, Broca's area is helping me articulate my uh, sp speech sounds. It's helping me utter the, the motor act of, of like bringing about speech sounds, these phonemes that I'm producing. That's in the left hemisphere and near the frontal lobe. It's in the, it's in the posterior part of the frontal lobe. That is underdeveloped, we believe, in individuals who have uh, stuttering. It's, it's not uh, operating at the same capacity and it uh, can manifest in a number of ways, but one of the ways it can manifest is a stutter. And so the, the key insight to knowing why someone like Megan Washington or someone who's who, this interesting case of this individual who, when he reads the Quran or sings the Quran, is, is not stuttering, is that there's likely a, a compensatory mechanism on the right side of the brain. So the right side of the brain that maps in parallel, that's called the homolog, maps a, a, a homologous structure to the left uh, of Broca's area. The right homolog is also doing work, but it's a different kind of work. It's not so concerned with the little details and producing you know, fine-grained speech sounds. It's looking at structures and connectivity among sounds really over the course of a sentence. So you can think of Broca's area really cares about the phonemes within a word. That's what it's designed for evolutionarily. And then the right hemisphere is more designed for more large structures, like what you would think of as intonation and prosody. These are, these are things that you know, musicians and poets tend to uh, you know, exploit to, to create a, a dramatic effect. And we use them all the time. Every, every culture has its own prosodic pattern. And what we think that the individuals who, who are stuttering what they're doing is they're letting the right hemisphere homologue do some of the work that would normally be done in the left hemisphere and so it's a type of we think it's a type of neuroplasticity neural reorganization where the right hemisphere just takes on more of the responsibility that would typically would not happen in someone who didn't stutter and so it's a it's a strategy that some people learn quite uh, unexpectedly that you know and and now that we know it we actually have a therapy that we, we we teach aphasics who you know people who have lost the ability to speak to sing it's called melodic intonation therapy and so we now know that the right hemisphere can be used to compensate and for this this sort of stuttering deficit and then when you, the goal is that you don't always have to sing everything that would get a little annoying if, if you had to sing all the time is that through plasticity, you can then stop stuttering without singing, but you would have to go through a period of using your right hemisphere to kind of bootstrap and help your left hemisphere get the job done.
That's that's great. I think it's very clear now. And the topic of plasticity is is, is also a, a great topic and nobody can cover it enough without going back to uh, the book, I think. Um, there is a different topic, which is you mentioned genes sometimes and usually in the literature and neuroscience and psychology in general, we read about some uh, genes that have some effects. Sometimes they can cause diseases. Sometimes they can we can inherit some traits. But how easily we can relate some mind or psychological features or traits to genes and would that make some difficulty for evolutionary psychology on how easy it is to relate or how easy or how difficult it is to relate genes with neurological psychological traits in the mind yes i i would like to acknowledge that it is no easy task <laughs> It is extremely hard, uh, but we believe if you do it in a smart way, uh, there's no reason to be afraid of genes and trying to understand complexity of the, the human mind. Uh, I think sometimes people oversimplify uh, when they talk about genes and they may have some sort of agenda, you know, to say, well, it's all in the genes and you can't, you can't help someone because it's all in the genes or nothing's in the genes, it's all in the environment. Those are very simplistic dichotomies. And for most things, it's a blend between the two. And so the way my approach is to start with some things that we know are genetically related. And then once we can start there, we can build outward. So I'll, I'll just give you one example. There is a, a genetic disorder called phenylketonuria or PKU. Uh, PKU is a form of uh, a developmental delay where there's cognitive deficits in memory and language. And we know that there is a genetic component and we've identified the sequence. I won't get into the details, but identified the gene sequence. And if you have this gene sequence, there's a high likelihood that you will develop PKU. However, if you intervene early in life, like if you change the diet of a pregnant mother, if the mother of someone who's at risk of PKU eats less protein, it's a certain they have to limit certain proteins, it does not trigger the disorder and uh, to the same degree. And these individuals end up developing in more neurotypical fashions. Uh, I think that's interesting for two reasons. One is it shows that something that seems like the mind, like memory and language, these pretty high level things does have a genetic component. It's not totally reducible to genes, but it does clearly, these complex things like language and memory are related to genes. But the second reason I really like that is that it shows that the environment is a crucial mechanism for either you know, turning on or off these genes. And I think that's the model that if we're gonna talk about high level cognition, things like language for sure, we're going to have to talk about the interplay between some genetic predispositions and then environmental input. And so th that's the, the, the first thing is it is possible to map, connect genes to high level things like language and memory, but not reduce them just to the gene. And which I think that both of those are important. Re but regarding like language specifically, uh, one of the mistakes that we think researchers traditionally ha have done historically when studying language is to look for genes that are specifically designed for language. So the quote unquote language gene. And most geneticists, certainly nowadays, most uh, molecular geneticists would say that's not the right way to think about genes and language. Instead, the way to think about genes and language is to think what are all the cognitive sub processes that allow language to you know come into being so language is not you know a thing unto itself it's really a bunch of smaller processes that need to work together in order for language to you know operate and if we can look for genes for those smaller components now we might be able to start mapping complex things like language down to genes and so i think the key insight, and you'll see this in the next 10 or 15 years when you see these genetic breakthroughs for very complex behaviors like language, is they're going to break language into smaller sub-processes and then show the links. And so one link, for example, is there, there is a genetic link to certain 
uh, forms of like speaking to be able to like make motor movements of your mouth. That's a basic skill. It's it's you know a, a, it's not easy, but it's a basic skill that if you disrupt, you're going to have language problems. And we do think that genes do tend to map onto basic motor abilities to produce speech sounds. And so the idea is if we can find more and more little gene uh, genes mapping onto these sub-processes will start to be able to piece together all the different genetic mechanisms for, for you know, the language, capital L language. So I think it's possible, and I, I just think you're right, it is, um, it is challenging, and I would say anytime you see a simplistic explanation, you should probably think that, that, that you know, someone's trying to sell you something that's not true. The second part of this question is actually about uh, evolutionary psychology, which is uh, mainly based or it should be based on uh, genetics and uh, inheritance uh, of traits. So would that be an obstacle and a challenge for uh, evolutionary psychology as well? Uh, I think evolutionary psychology that takes a sophisticated view of how genes map on to various traits, it, it's not challenging. I mean, it, technically it's very challenging, but conceptually it's not a, like a fundamental challenge to evolutionary psychology. My understanding of evolutionary psychology is it's a field that wants to try to explain human behavior in terms of its adaptive function, at least historically it's adaptive function. and. If you're going to do that, then you're going to have to consider genes is because we know that that's one of the methods of inheritance. And so I don't see it as a necessarily a threat to evolutionary psychology. I do see it as a threat to oversimplified evolutionary psychology. And so sometimes evolutionary psychology, it makes the rounds in the news because there's, you know, really bold claims like, you know, there's a gene for aggression, you know, like aggression is a complicated behavior and it's likely there are genes for components of aggression. That's true. But what, or a gene for love or a gene for language is my specialty. But, you know, those, those things are so complex that you're not going to find a single gene, let alone even like a cluster of genes that are going to map onto anything quite that complex. So it is a threat for simplistic models of evolutionary psychology, but there's enough smart uh, researchers in you know in the the field now who, who who are starting to talk to like actual molecular geneticists uh, evolutionary psychology that is not talking to molecular genet you know the the molecular biologists that's a problem i think they have to talk to one another if the field's going to grow yeah, Doctor, your explanation of the gene FOX2P was uh, mm. great, and it's also something that uh, we advise the audience to get back to. And I may share if uh, I think I mentioned it in one of the articles as a metaphor, how you simplified the role of FOX2P in other species. Right, right, e exactly. The idea, there are these, uh, here's another something that evolutionary psychology sometimes misses is that there are a lot of genetic mechanisms that are not unique to humans that that map onto complex things in humans that other species have but they don't have those complex things and so uh, clearly humans are the only ones that have human language and you know capital l language and it's full of glory and complexity yet there are other species that had the FOX2P gene, you know, the mice have it, dogs have it. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a, it's what's called an evolutionarily conserved gene and means it's, it's been reused for lots of uh, species. And we think whenever you see that, it's likely it's being used for some more fundamental processes that get co-opted by organisms to serve, you know, other functions. And I think, I mean, humans, you so you've you've read the book and so you know i don't think that language we have a language gene it's because we don't need a language gene we we just need genes for all the things that help you build language over development that that's what you know humans need that and it turns out that we have a lot of the genes and genetic mechanisms for language are shared by other species which is quite fascinating uh and 
it, it, it makes you realize you have to think more, uh, it's a more complex story than just saying language is genetic. <laughs> when we share a lot of the same, you know, machinery with other species. Yes, yes. Um, doctor, you mentioned the multiple parts in the brain that are uh, specific to language. So can we now comfortably say that there is no part of the brain for the language? And what are the main parts? And the, the, what are the other functions that they do? This vision, of course, is adopted by uh, Elizabeth Bates, right? Which you, you yes. referred to multiple times. We also had some article about her, which we can share as well. But uh, yeah, back to the question, which is the parts of the language in the brain and what are the other functions of these parts so that uh, someone may, may understand this idea very well that this part is, is doing this by the same time it is doing this functionality which is related to the language. Right. Well, first of all, I want to say I, I when I was looking at your website, I saw that you did have a picture of Liz Bates on the cover of one of your magazines, and I was extremely impressed. I, I think Liz Bates is, was ahead of her time in terms of thinking about language in the brain, and she was a huge influence on, on me, and so I thought that was very cool, and I'm glad your readers are going to get to to read about this brilliant woman. Uh, so the the idea, you know, to, to, to quote Bates, the, the idea that language is a new machine built out of old parts. That's it's such a great little quote. And those old parts are genetic, those are, are genetically specified parts. It's not like, you know, the parts that you have to as assemble, like find over development. You are born with the parts. If you have a human brain, you're born with the parts that will be useful for language. And then through experience and plasticity, you then connect those parts up to create a language brain. And so you wire up the system, but the, the parts are in place. And so your question was, well, what are those parts? And if they're not designed for language evolutionarily and they get you know co-opted for language, what are they doing? Well, there's a lot of them. And I, if you haven't recommended to your, your readers yet, the, the paper I would recommend is a, a classic paper by Greg Hickok and David Poppel, a 2007 paper called The Cortical Organization of Speech Processing. It's in, it's in the uh, journal Nature. And they make the case of a very elaborate network, and I'm, I'm not going to try to do it justice uh, <laughs> in this short time. I'll, I'll hit a couple of key pieces. It's an elaborate network that spans the left and right hemispheres. That's the first, you know, notable feature. It's not all left lateralized, you know, not all in the left hemisphere. And it involves some of the major players. So I mentioned Broca's area, which is in the frontal lobe. It also involves an area in the superior temporal lobe. We, we call it Wernicke's area, but there, you know, there are all sorts of you know, the superior temporal gyrus, depending on what kind of language you're speaking. But these are these are terms that you know, most people who are familiar about language, they've heard of Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Those are two main hubs for two pathways of language. And and, and you recall in, in the, my book, I talk about this dorsal pathway and a ventral pathway. Dorsal just means uh, towards the top of the head and ventral is just towards the bottom of the of the the head or the brain and there's a pathway like if right, right when you hear like right now as i'm speaking these words are hitting your your eardrum sending vibrations through your co cochlea and then down your auditory nerve to your auditory cortex and that's the point of departure at least for spoken language and your auditory cortex sends the signal backwards towards this broke a, a Wernicke's area, and it's there where you start separating functions. And so at Wernicke's area, one pathway that goes ventral or, or on the bottom side of your brain starts to map those sounds onto meaning. So it starts just like, first it starts, you know, what are the phonemes I'm even hearing? And then how do these phonemes combine into words? And what do these words mean? And then how do these words combine in a sentence? And it starts processing the meaning, but, and then this dorsal pathway, the one that goes towards the top of your head, 
it's starting, this is this surprises some people, it's starting to actually map those sounds onto motor outputs. And so the way what that pathway is actually doing is when you're hearing this speech, you are simulating the production of this speech yourself in your dorsal pathway. And you're you're trying to map the sounds onto your own motor construction and that's one way you know you know by doing and so you may have heard of mirror neurons the way you know you understand someone's reaching behavior by simulating those same reaching behavior in your brain researchers think that you are doing that to some extent when you're hearing language and it's just happening so fast i mean and this is why when you speak a second language it's so hard because you can't simulate it it's just you don't have the motor skills it's like a baby uh, trying to to babble, you 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 can't process it all, and so you have a breakdown in this dorsal pathway, and both pathways meet in this Broca's area in the frontal part of your brain, what some have called the unification site, where it just it combines the meaning and the motor movements, and and that's when you uh, under, you you can put it all together. That's the basic pathway, and the, the really cool thing about that pathway is it's not a one directional street. You are constantly doing this pathway, and then you send signals backwards along the dorsal and ventral rod backwards to predict what's going to happen next. And so anytime you are hearing language, you're trying to predict what's the next word or what's coming at the end of the sentence because you want to make it easier for you to, to understand the meaning. And that's all happening in the left hemisphere, and, and the, the right hemisphere is is analyzing different aspects of that system, the prosody and the things that connect words over lar larger spans. And all together, that network is helping you assemble meaning on the fly. And as you build meaning, it gets easier to understand new meaning. And that's why, you know, words at the end of the sentences are easier to understand than words at the beginning. You have more context built up. So that network is, involves brain regions that are involved in lots of different things, not just language, but lots of different things. And so I mentioned mirror neurons. Broca's area in the left hemisphere is also involved in understanding reaching behavior. When you know someone reaches for an object, Broca's area, or we call it the inferior frontal gyrus, is simulating that reaching. And so we think this language pathway hijacked or piggybacked on top of evolutionarily ancient systems like reaching behaviors and it co-opted it to to take on this new fancy function that humans have for language and so that's just one example of how language is built on a an old machine an old machine part which is a, a machine part involved in grasping with your hands i think uh, that's great uh, doctor why i think I don't know if it's a good example, uh, but it also leads to another question. Uh, you mentioned uh, the cognitive uh, control, and it's actually good news for uh, multilinguals. And uh, you also mentioned that uh, bilingualism is not uh, a rare thing in the world, and it's not something new for the humanities. It's something that was always there and was always happening and required for communication between humans. But when I tried to talk about cognitive control for the first time, it looked difficult for me to explain it, uh, to explain that relationship with, uh, with multilingualism. And so what's, what, is, what is cognitive control? And uh, what is the advantage of the cognitive control, a better cognitive control? And how can the language enhance it? The, I mean, the multilingualism. Mm, right. Well, so I'll come back to this this language network that I just described. This, uh, this You don't need to appreciate the complexities of the network, but just appreciate that every language that you speak operates according to the same basic network, but there's different activations. So if you're speaking Arabic, that you have the network working in a little bit of a different way than if you're speaking English. There's the different speech sounds, different meanings. So there's a, there's a lot of different nodes of activation. And so if you think about these neural networks, they're all different for every language within a bilingual mind. When you're speaking one, you need a mechanism for suppressing the other. 
because if you're spe we're speaking English right now, it's not very useful for you to have, you know, Turkish active in your mind right now or Arabic. I know you speak like seven languages. So you, you have a lot of different <laughs> networks going, but they're not relevant right now. Right now, what's relevant is your English network. And so cognitive control is the ability of your frontal lobe, the very front part of your brain, to tell your language network which one is relevant, which one do I activate and which ones do I suppress. And cognitive control is, is really the, is I activate this by suppressing this or these. And anytime that you have to switch, now if I were you know bilingual and I could speak one of the many languages you speak and I suddenly switched over, now we would, the frontal lobe would say, okay, I, I need to switch to my new network, okay? Now think about doing a bilingual, especially in a very multicultural environment. You're in London and you're exposed, I bet you're speaking many different languages on a daily basis. I, I mean, at least more than one on a daily basis, you're exposed to yeah, it. Three or four. Okay, there you go. So you are, um, your frontal lobe has become expert at suppressing irrelevant information, irrelevant languages. What, what cognitive control theories, they take a step further and they say, not only are you excellent at shutting down irrelevant languages, you are excellent at shutting down irrelevant information, generally speaking, so that if the task at hand is to figure out how to, uh, you, know, you know, change a light bulb, <laughs> You're not going to be distracted by thinking, you know, about some other task. You can you can shut it down and you can focus on whatever task is at hand. And that ability to suppress irrelevant information comes as an advantage, uh, according to this is Ellen Bialystok. If if your readers or, or viewers want to uh, read up, she's at the University of York, I think, in Canada. Ellen Bialystok, and I can send you the name later, but. She's become quite famous making the case that bilinguals and multilinguals are using the benefits of this cognitive control to uh, have better working memory and a, be a better ability to switch between tasks uh, and instead of having one task bleed into another. And she even makes the controversial claim, it's controversial just because it's disputed, the, there's still a debate over it, that uh, bilinguals are, uh, have slower rates of uh, age-related memory de decline. And so working memory abilities get worse over the lifetime just as a function of aging. And she argues that bilinguals have a mechanism, the cognitive control mechanism slows that process down and literally helps people like stave off things like, you know, Alzheimer's or things like that. It's a very bold claim. And, and I would hope that your readers would, would know that that's an area of, of a fierce debate right now. But the idea is that you have basically flexed a muscle. You've gotten good at switching between um, you've two different tasks and you are able to keep the frontal lobe sh sharp. And the frontal lobe is where a lot of, uh, of action happens in terms of aging and you know, just development. The frontal lobe is the latest thing to develop in, in children. And, and so this, the skill of being a bilingual helps beef up that frontal lobe and have these, you know, these possible benefits. And so that's one area that people have argued where bilinguals have an advantage is they can suppress irrelevant information and that gives their frontal lobe, uh, it, it strengthens it and makes it uh, less likely to, to deteriorate. Mentioning the the multiple uh, nationalities and uh, places like uh, London, uh, Doctor, it was very interesting, the, the experiment that you mentioned about the Turks and the English speakers, the native English speakers, when they listen to emotionally loaded words. So can we run away from a time or a place that we didn't like and just go to a new neutral area? That that could have so many uh, implications. Yes, that that's uh, one of my favorite study by Caldwell Harris, who I'll just just sum it up real quickly. When you hear emotionally charged words like you know reprimands, like you know bad job or you did something wrong or stop it, like 
things that would make a child uh, have a strong emotional resonance in a child, if you hear that in your native language, it's more affectively charged than if you hear it in your second language. And that's led some people to believe, to argue that speaking in a second language is a way of emotionally distancing yourself from the content. And, and one mechanism, it's, it's a pretty simple, I, one, one mechanism is simple. When you, if you grew up speaking, these, these individuals grew up speaking Turkish, those Turkish reprimands actually happened to them in Turkish in their family. And so they actually have real memories of being told they're a bad job or stop it or, you know, whatever. I can't remember all the reprimands. And that's a charged environment, one's family life. But they learned English later in life in the classroom. And when you learn a language in the classroom, it's much less emotionally charged. It's more academic <laughs> to, you know, you're, you're sitting there, you're studying, there's a teacher, you're not being reprimanded, hopefully in a good language classroom, <laughs> that's not really the best way to teach someone how to learn a language. And so you have more of a neutral learning context around your L2. That's one reason why, you, you know, that, that effect may happen. The consequences of that are fascinating, regardless of the, the mechanism of what really makes the emotional distance. The consequences are, some have argued, that you can think more rationally when you're thinking in your second language. You, you can push down the emotional impulse and think through a problem with more uh, level-headed clarity. And so I can't, I can't remember if I, I talk about the trolley yes. task. Yes, the trolley task where you're, many people are familiar with this idea that there's a, a trolley who's gonna run into a, a, a person and uh, uh, four people. And if you pull the trolley switch, it would divert the track so it only runs into one person. And which is, which is the logical choice to, to, to kill one person yeah. rather than four. Yes, exactly. It's a logical choice. It's called the utilitarian judgment. And it, if you ask uh, AI, artificial intelligence, it's going to have a very easy answer. It's going to say, of course you pull that trigger. It's going to only kill one person. But humans have a real hard time pulling that trolley uh, lever. But if you have them do it in their second language, they're more likely to behave like a computer, which is interesting. They're more likely to say, yeah, I'll pull that. And what we think is that this, this second language allows you to navigate ideas with less emotional charge. And uh, I, I'll just give you an anecdote that this comes from my, uh, my, my wife who teaches Japanese at Colgate. And she does a, uh, a speech contest where English speakers or speakers from all over you know, the world come to Colgate when they're, they, it's a contest for speaking in Japanese. And this one American student wanted to give a speech about how during high school, his parents lost all uh, their money and they had to live out of a car in a, uh, in, like, in a park for one year. He went to his senior year in high school living out of a car. And of course, you can imagine he was ashamed and it, it was just very traumatic. And he decided to give a speech on this subject in Japanese. And the reason why he could do it is he had he told my wife he could he could actually think about it for the first time ever when he thought about it in Japanese. And he said he never shared this with anyone else. And he gave a speech and he won a prize. He won the, the top prize. It was a beautiful speech. And uh, he he was able to then after that start talking about this difficult time in his life. And I think that's just a fantastic example of what you can do if you have a second language to navigate, you know, complex the complexities of life. And, and so some therapists e even try to help their patients who, who speak multiple languages by speaking to them in their non-native language so that they can see things from, you know, uh, different perspectives. And so I think there's a, there's a lot to be explored there with emotion and, and, and second languages. I tried this uh, doctor with uh, with the Spanish, where I don't feel uh, ashamed when I talk about the same thing that uh, I would describe it in uh, English or in, uh, in Arabic. So really, I, you've, yeah. you've experienced this yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I can say I can say things that uh, I usually can't say uh, in the same way, at least in uh, in my language, my native language. 
That's interesting. I, I, I'll give you, this is an example that maybe some people can resonate with. There are three words in English that's very hard for uh, young people to say to if they're dating or something like that. Saying, I love you is a big deal. It's a big deal, certainly in my culture, if uh, a couple, someone actually says that. But I've heard stories where someone has told their partner that they love them first in, in a second language because it, it allowed them to, to kind of get it out in a safer environment. And so I think that's an example of something that probably some, some of your listeners have experienced. <laughs> I think the example that uh, I just I just will mention because this topic is very interesting, although I want to move to a, a more interesting uh, uh, part. To, uh, it's many of the Arabs find it fine to say the word sex in English, and it is less easy to say it in the standard Arabic, which is another language, but it's close to the to the Arabic dialects, which is also uh, considered uh, uh, as language as well. But saying the word sex in the local dialects in Arabic is not only emotionally loaded, it's... Uh, it's uh, something that you can't say normally. <laughs> That's interesting. There, are, there really are some words that if you say in your native language, they're, they're almost impossible to say in public. And I, I, there are some words that I will not say in English, especially uh, around a, a certain dialectical environments. That's, that's a universal, apparently. <laughs> I, I have... Uh... Two questions from two of my friends and colleagues in, in real sciences, and I'm going to read them, not uh, to read them as, as they have written them. And it is very interesting for me because uh, unlike my questions, which are questions that are closer to the audience of someone who is interested in the topic, these are questions from a specialist. The first question is... Uh, from uh, Ramzi Mohammed, uh, a psychiatrist in Saudi Arabia. And his question says, my question is about the relationship between language and psychosis. In chronic psychosis cases, schizophrenia particularly, I noticed some issues in the language production. Some patients were creating new words. Others were connecting irrelevant words with a rhyme despite the lack of semantic relation between them, clang association, while others were making uh, word salad where they mix words without any phonetic, lexical, or grammatical sense. Now, is there an essential relationship between psychosis and language? Some studies mentioned that the cognital deaf and the dumb patients rarely become psychotic. Does that mean that language role and understanding the reality could have some role in psychosis so that when language degenerates, the understanding of the reality gets affected in the same way or vice versa? Ramzi. Well, what a fascinating question. So th thank you for that. And this is really at the limits of, of my knowledge. And I've explored this area uh, a little bit just because it is so interesting. The, the first thing is to acknowledge that, you know, indeed, uh, the, the language disruptions uh, for schizophrenia are, are really, you know, diagnostic. It's certainly in some criteria in the West, uh, in the Di Diagnostic Statisticians Manual, cer certain of those, you know, neologisms and uh, stream of consciousness and even just lack of... Um, uh, speaking slow speaking rate or very short sentences those are uh, can be diagnostic uh, of individuals with schizophrenia and so the, there's definitely a relation there the i hadn't thought about it in the way that your uh your reader asked it which is could those not just be a manifestation of the schizophrenia but a mechanism for it that's a great really cool question and I have a couple of thoughts on that. One is that we do know that the human mind, uh, it, it, and this seems to be true across cultures. I dare dare I speak of universals, but this one seems to be pretty darn close. The human mind is a storytelling device. It that's it, it tells stories. It builds narratives about the world and your your place in it and your own identity. Your, you know, your identity is a story to some extent, if you think about it. Uh, 
And these narrative structures, a narrative is a, a linguistic structure that we, we build ourselves. And it's possible that once you build that structure, you need to have built that structure in order to see a, th a threat to that structure. And so it, it needs to, the narrative needs to be there before we have a problem, a disruption of that narrative. So that's just one uh, psychological thought about how language and language ability might be a mechanism for, I mean, I don't know how the break happens, and that's the part I'm not sure what happened when the narrative gets challenged, maybe, because a lot of times my schizophrenia is diagnosed, um, you know, right after adolescence, people are, are being exposed to the world in new ways and and there could be threats to those narratives and, the, and that could cause a fracture that could could really create these psychic um, really extreme case, uh, situations in some individuals. So that that's one possibility. Another idea that it gave me is this idea of a critical period in language. People from about zero to 12 to 15, it's somewhere around basically zero birth to adolescence is the window of opportunity for you to truly master a language. And if you learn a language much after that, you're going to you're not going to master it unless you're a gifted actor or just a just there are some individuals who can pull it off but it's hard to learn it after that age and it's interesting that 15 years of age is about the time in which people are diagnosed or that's from my understanding with schizophrenia or psychotic breaks and i wonder if that's a coincidence i've never heard anyone make that argument and that's why i'm so happy with this question because i'm gonna i'm gonna read up on it myself and so this idea of the critical period closing and the psychotic break happening really interesting hypothesis so that's just a thought and then the last thing i'll point your reader to is there there's some cool new uh, programs, and I know, Omar, you're interested in natural language processing, and I can share this paper with you. It's analyzing the speech output of individuals who are going, who, who later will be di diagnosed with schizophrenia, analyzing it before they're diagnosed, and using an algorithm, AI can predict 80% accuracy, 80% accuracy or what individuals may end up being diagnosed with schizophrenia. And that's just remarkable. It's just, it just tells you that the link between language and schizophrenia, there's something deep there. And uh, so those are just a couple thoughts and that truly is one I'm gonna have to think about more. The other question, doctor, I will add something and I will ask about another question about uh, Ramsey's question. Uh, but I don't want to put myself uh, between two specialists, and I'm not. Um, the other question is from um, my friend also, and uh, also he's a colleague in real sciences, and he also writes some articles. Both Ramzi and uh, Isam uh, write uh, <clears throat> articles in real sciences. So his question says, uh, and he's a, a resident doctor in neurology in, uh, in Baghdad, Iraq. Uh, he says, when does a human start getting indulged uh, rhymes in uh, poems? And what is the neurodevelopment that happens in the brain for that? And why it is difficult for someone to enjoy poetry in other languages in the same way as it is with his or her own language, even after being fluent in that language? For example, I, I will uh, interrupt his question and say, Maybe most of the Arabs don't enjoy any poetry in English. Uh, mm -hmm. And then he continues, does it have to do with the phrases and the words being used? Or is it related to developing special networks that would need to be developed in earlier age? Uh, Islam. Right, right. So I think... Again, that's another interesting question, and I, I can th you can think about you know, rhymes and poems. Rhymes and po poetry could be some middle ground between typical face-to-face -face language and music, and so you could think about perhaps this on a continuum, and poetry might operate between you know st standard language and and music. And what I mean by that, poetry. It, it, Again, there's huge cultural differences, but uh, in a lot of poetry, there are certain almost like rules of syntax and rules of 
structuring again at the at the the sentence level and so prosody again uh, emphasis of a certain word meter these sorts of things uh those are uh, I, I think we're all designed, our, our right hemispheres are designed to be on the lookout for that kind of structuring. And I think depending on whatever culture you, you grow up in, you commit your right hemisphere to that prosodic pattern. And in the, in the case, I mean, this isn't just poetry, but there are certain prosodies where you know, in English, you, you finish a sentence, if you're asking a question, you finish with a, a rising intonation. But that's not true in all languages. Some languages, you have a falling intonation, and there's all sorts of various uh, cultural and linguistic differences across uh, languages. Uh, but those things, once you commit to them, they're hard to uncommit to. Just like once you commit to a phoneme, once I commit to English phonemes, it's very, very hard for me to hear uh, Arabic, some Arabic speech sounds I can't even process. Literally, my ear does not hear the distinction between them. And I think that also might operate at higher levels, This these prosodic structures. I, it's not that you can't hear them, but you might not be able to see the, the, the pattern that holds them together. And so I think probably what's happening, it's not so different from when you you commit to your native language with regular old speech. I think you commit to the, the rhyme structure and the intonational structure and the music structure of your culture's um, you know, you know, rhyme and music. And so I think, I think it's more of this you know, neural commitment and plasticity kind of locking in place what you think will be useful for you to you know, navigate your, your particular language and culture. I think, uh, doctor, you wouldn't be able to pronounce a and e, which are both different letters, but a, a is more difficult. Uh, yes, <laughs> I think I need a lot more practice. Plus, <laughs> I, Hopefully uh, less practice than what you need for uh, the Japanese. I, I, yes, I, I'm taking one language at a time. So Japanese is, uh, I hope my, my brain can handle the, the changes. <laughs> I, uh, going to uh, Ramsey's question, uh, Doctor, you, you mentioned many things, but one of the things that are stuck in my mind since the last time when I listened to the book is the uncertainty. Uh, you mentioned uh, the colors and you mentioned that th there, there was some experience when, when we have some parts that are related to the language and it is uncertain to our minds and there are parts that similar to being built in in our minds and in the book number sense which you recommended it kind of gives this idea that most of the humans have the count one two three are able to count to one two three even before they learn the language and many animals as well even more than one mm -hmm. two three I think the ravens until until five or seven. Does that the the, the relation with the uh, uh, psychosis has something to do with uh, having these uncertain ideas being on the same level or equal to the uh, other ideas that represents the basis of our thinking and the basis of our mind? Things that we need more, things that we should prioritize. Hmm. Interesting. So the you're, you're asking if having language is a a way of imposing some certainty onto an uncertain world that gives us some kind of structure for navigating that world. Yeah, it would. It would. It w would it give us unrealistic worlds because it's something that that is made up somehow. It okay. is related to some sensations. But we can, at the same time, build something. You mentioned the narratives. Uh, many authors make their own worlds in a story. And uh, I'm not sure about people with psychosis. Would it, can, can we uh, uh, give a metaphor to, to the same way that they are living in their own world, which is not realistic and has, has different rules? And maybe it's moving. Maybe it's not. Maybe everything is moving in that world. Mm hmm. That's really interesting. I keep coming back to the question of what is is you know, for schizophrenia. Is it 
the way of thinking that changes first and then language just follows along or is it the other way around the way of you know thinking in language because i'm not just talking about speaking but we, we often think in words and sentences uh is that changing and then that causes this dis disordered way of seeing things that is a like i i would love to know how you pull those two things apart. If I'm understanding your question correctly, you're suggesting the latter, that it's possible that there's some some kind of breakdown in the, in the ability to use language in a, this ordered way that then causes this cascade effect, effect that breaks down our thinking about the world in an ordered way. And that's a, that's a fascinating hypothesis. And I, uh, huh. I'd really have to think about that one some more. It, it, I'll just tell you where my brain went right there. If that's the case, and this is a scary experiment, if you disrupted abil an ability of someone to speak, you know, routinely disrupted their ability. So somehow every time they tried to say a sentence, they 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 it didn't make sense. If you did that enough, you should be able to induce a psychosis in an individual, which is a very scary thought. I, you know, I'm an experimental psychologist, a neuroscientist, so I always think, how could you test this? And that would be testing, you know, the language as a mechanism for the actual disruption. Uh, what, can yeah. it, what can it be induced? Actually, I I, I still remember when I was living in Iraq, you, you, we, you can't you can't speak usually. You can't say something about the government. You may get mm. uh, yourself or your your or family killed if you say something wrong. So I remember one guy who was running in the streets and uh, cursing the the dictator by that time, Saddam Hussein, and it was uh, everybody was afraid just by seeing him doing this. So the hypothesis was this guy has spent maybe months or years in a horrible prison and the result is this is the result and there are similar stories in i think in iraq and in many other countries that were ruled by totalitarian regimes when you can see someone who uh, gets out of the prison but he he or she totally lost their uh, minds right well in that case there's there's a couple of things that happen in those environments. One is just the phys the physical strain on the horrible things that happen. But from what I understand, there's a lot of psychological uh, torture as well. Like, you know, making people say certain things or hear certain things. And so I'm sure you've heard of some of the horrible things that the Americans did in Guantanamo Bay, which expose prisoners to a would play music and show imagery that was very American that they knew would would violate someone's religious beliefs and fundamental beliefs and just that expo and make them say certain things they didn't want to say. And that I, I think is a form of breaking someone by forcing someone to hear language or say things that would violate what you really you know believed in your heart just to stop some awful thing from happening, that's a form of brainwashing. I, I do think it's, it's, and I think a lot of powerful, you know, bad people are using language to you know, cr change the way someone thinks. And that can lead to these total breaks. I think once you realize you've changed because you're forced to speak a certain way or act a certain way. So I think the relationship, it's not just physical, but there is this, this linguistic thing that happens in, in captivity as well. Yes, yes, uh, doctor. That's uh, that's something I missed. Of course, it's uh, it's the maybe the la the language thing or the ability to say something is is a minor thing compared to uh, the general experience in uh, in these uh, horrible uh, prisons. I think our questions are done, and uh, it was uh, super interesting for me and for the audience as well. It will be we will publish it uh, in text in the magazine. Yeah, I just want to say I. I... I'm really happy you contacted me and you you shared links to your work. I, I think what you're doing is extremely important. I I read your mission statement and trying to share science to debunk a lot of the the things that that some people just say without really knowing what's what's been done and what's out there. 
it's a it's a wonderful resource, and I'm I'm so happy to hear that you and your organizers have have built this network, and it sounds like it's it's growing. So I just wanted to say uh, applaud you for those efforts. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you for uh, your time and for all these interesting facts and for all your uh, efforts in, in, in the field. It's my pleasure, Omar. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.